Okay, the next uh, suborder I want to deal with here is the next one that's mentioned in your handout, the Histricomorpha. And it's only represented by uh, one species in North America, but by many others in Central and South America. However, before I'm going to talk about the Histricomorpha, I'll talk briefly about the suborder that we don't deal with in this lab because we don't have any specimens. And that is, oops, sorry, is the suborder Animal, animal Euromorpha. Morpha, animal Euromorpha. That's a tongue twister, right? Uh, there are only two or three uh, families in this um, in this suborder. Very unusual rodents from uh, uh, Southeast Asia and South Africa, respected, respectively. Uh, check. Uh, go to page one thirty five in your lab manual, and also the relevant part of your textbook to be familiar with these, because you do need to know this suborder and. If you can even remember the uh, one of the families and one of the common names, that would be good. But they're represented by two very different uh, body plans or bow plans, as they call them. They're the scaly-tailed squirrels, the animal Uridae, which gives its name to the suborder, of course, the family animal Uridae. And uh, these are scaly-tailed squirrels, which, some of which are flying or gliding squirrels, and then they're more terrestrial species. But they're actually, according to your lab manual, you see that there are two families uh, represented there. But if you just remember anim animal uridae and scaly-tailed squirrels for one, the other very distinctive creature that we're dealing with here is the, um, are the spring hare of uh, South Africa. And uh, there's, uh, let's see, page 135 in your lab manual, has a nice diagram. They're, they're also in your textbook. But uh, here you can see on page 135, an image of, of a spring hare, family Peditidae, the Southern African spring hare, Pedites capensis. You can see its distribution in the in southern, uh, southern African continent, uh, as opposed to just the country of South Africa. Don't get confused between the country and the region. And it's the family Peditidae, the spring here, or spring haas. Spring haas, I guess, is the, is the Afrikaans, or that Dutch uh, settler language of South Africa. That's all I have to say about the animal Euromorpha. Oh yeah, the one other thing I should say is that they do have a Histricomorphous um, jaw condition. If you look at, uh, again, to your textbook and you'll see uh, that referred to that, um, at least in the, uh, they have an, uh, the, at least in the Pedita day, uh, they have an extremely large infraorbital foramen, like you see in the um, in the Histricomorph uh, rodents, which we'll be dealing with with the porcupine. But um, the uh, other family, um, the other family, uh, the infraorbital foramen, is a combination of a large infraorbital. Uh, canal with no zygomatic plates. So they also have this large um, infraorbital foramen but a histriconathus lower jaw. Okay, so now let's deal with the, um, we'll deal with the suborder Histricomorpha and the only species in North America is the, as I mentioned, is the porcupine, the North American porcupine. Uh, these, uh, the North American porcupine is in the family Erythizontidae, a family that you need to know from your handout. And the species you also need to know, Erythizon dorsatum. Dorsatum, that latter part, the species name, comes from the fact that they have all these stiff spines, these barbed spines on the, on the fur of the dorsal part of the body. So that's where they get that name. And uh, here, I don't have a full skin to display here. It's just too difficult to, to transport. And our skin is a bit uh, damaged in any case. And needless to say, I'm showing you these labs from my home. 
because of the complexity involved in trying to do it from campus. But this is just the head region, and here you can see. Oops, let me see here. My tripod is moving. Um, here you can see the eyes. This is the left eye. That's the right eye. This is the snout, the nose. And this is really fur. It's fairly stiff fur, but uh, these are not sharp spines like you see up here on the back and going from the back of the head all the way back to the tail. And they um, protect themselves by charging rearwards into predators like coyotes, mountain lions and others. But if a mountain lion flips it over on its belly, um, then it can kill it because the, um, they do not have spines on their belly and they're not protected there. So the really distinctive thing with this animal are those enormous um, infraorbital foramina, foramina is plural for foramens. And here, this is uh, looking towards the front of the skull. And there you can see on the left, those are not eye sockets. Those are the infraorbital foramina, where the masseter muscles uh, originate on the rostrum, pass through the infraorbital foramina, and then insert on the lower jaw. And here you see the, uh, the lower jaw condition, and it's a siuronathus jaw condition. You can see how the angular process is in line with the alveoli of those lower incisors. Now remember, the, if you've forgotten, you're only seeing the external part of those lower incisors here. The root of those goes into uh, a socket or an alveolus, plural alveoli, that extends way the heck back here. So this tooth, if this, um, if we pull this tooth, it would be about about that long. It'd be about an inch and a half to nearly two inches long that tooth. And again, remember this is the siuronathus condition where the angular process of the lower jaw is in line with that alveolus, it's not inflected away from it. And here you can see that angular process. See the angular process down here, it's pretty large and well-developed. By contrast, look at the carnoid process. This is, well, let me look at the other side where it's not damaged. This is the carnoid process, it's tiny. Tiny, because this is the articular surface here. This is the carnoid process here on the porcupine. So the porcupine skull is very distinctive. You shouldn't confuse it with a, with a, a yellow-bellied marmot skull or, um, or the other big rodents that we've looked at. Uh, well, I'll show you one more on the to come yet, the muskrat, but you shouldn't confuse it with the marmot skull. You shouldn't con confuse it with the beaver skull and you shouldn't confuse it uh, with a mountain beaver skull. So just before I finish this um, short video here and move on to the myomorpha, I'm gonna pull out those other skulls just for comparison. So, so that's the hystricinate condition or hystricomorphous condition here on the uh, porcupine. Okay, here's the beaver. Remember the beaver has those little slit-like infraorbital foramina, a siuromorphous condition on the castoridae. Let's take a look at another squirrel. Here's the marmot skull. The marmot skull, again, this tiny slit-like um, infraorbital foramen on each side of the rostrum. So there you've got three of them there side by side. You've got the hystricomorphous condition here with these very large foramina, small slit-like ones on the castorimorphous. So this is a siuromorph condition on the, on the beaver and then the siuromorph condition here on the, um, on uh, the marmot, yellow-bellied marmot. And let's pull in one more fairly large run while we're at it. Uh, this is, we'll be looking at this in the next video again. This is, this is a muskrat, another aquatic rodent, fairly big. Um, but uh, let's see if I can, it's hard to see this in this light. 
Now, this is a smaller skull, but you can see they have a fairly well-developed infraorbital foramen. See it there? And it's usually V-shaped, and we'll get back to that on the next video. So all of these skulls are very distinctive if you know what to look for. And that's all I have to say for now about the hystricomorph rodents.